Hi, my name is Rob Scott from UC Today News and welcome to our April Microsoft Teams News Update. As always, I'm joined by Microsoft Teams expert and co-founder of Empowering Cloud, Tom Abuthnot. And together, we're going to be talking through the most popular Teams headlines across the month. Um, plus, then after the news, we're going to be diving into some open Teams Q&A with our panel of experts uh, on the line today as well. And hopefully, we'll be having some fun just talking through the latest and greatest Teams headlines because there's lots happened this month. But let's get started. Welcome, Tom. Yeah. Hey, Rob. How's it going? Yeah, really good. Really good. Just got back from Orlando, Florida. Enterprise you're, li Care. you're literally just back, aren't you? <laughs> literally just got back, yeah. Um, but, you know, it's uh, it's been such a big month in March. Uh, lots to talk about. I mean, you know, how's it been for you? Yeah, good. Yeah, I mean, Enterprise Connect um, was a really great event. It's just back-to-back -back meetings with, with vendors and Microsoft and customers. So really enjoyed that. And that's been the bulk of the news. So it's a great time for a, an update show because there was so much news dropped at Enterprise Connect. Great. Well, we got a great, uh, superb crowd on the line today to run through some of the news. But let's start with the big one. Why not? Let's talk about Microsoft Copilot. Yeah, what's, this is. What's your take, Tom? Yeah, this was the huge one. So this was actually announced the week before Enterprise Connect. So um, it was technically a pre-Enterprise pre Connect, but then it got re-demoed at Enterprise Connect live on stage. Um, for those that haven't seen, I think everybody must have seen this now. This is taking uh, OpenAI's chat GPT type modeling and putting it into Office 365. So not just Teams, but the whole Office 365. So last week, well, the week before Enterprise Connect, Microsoft did a demo where they showed it creating PowerPoint decks, converting PowerPoint decks into Word documents, um, even getting into things like Viva, uh, but at Enterprise Connect, it really focused on the Teams elements, which are things like in mid-meeting, you could ask the co-pilot what's gone in the meeting so far, summarize the points for me, what's the tone of the meeting, uh, and things like after the meeting, you could also query what happened. So Microsoft came up with this concept of following a meeting where you don't actually attend, you press follow, and it will fire you a summary of the key points based on using those large language models and that, that chat GPT like experience. Yeah, there's so much on show, wasn't it? And, and, and to, to show those specific use cases was absolutely perfect for the, the crowd at Enterprise Connect. I mean, in terms of, um, you know, favorites, I mean, I, I particularly like the follow a meetings, uh, you know, feature. Um, I think I, I'm going to get a lot of use out of that. Tom, do you have a favorite? Yeah, I mean, that was definitely a good one. I think what's interesting about this is everybody at the show announced something to do with AI. Like AI was the topic of the show across all the vendors. Um, and, and we've had AI around for a while in terms of things like codec optimization and video optimization. What's super interesting now is it's using the AI against the information. Obviously, Microsoft have the, the meeting transcript, they have the emails, they have the chat, they have the all the other data across SharePoint. So I think what's really interesting is not just this initial stuff we're seeing around Teams where potentially another vendor could summarize a meeting, but when it gets into like, tell me what my latest engagement with my customer have been, it spans chat, email and meetings. That's where it's really exciting for me. Yeah, it's really good. I mean, AI was the theme, wasn't it, last week at the event? So um, I know we're going to see lots more and more from the industry and from Microsoft on this. But um, yeah, it's, it's going to be certainly one to uh, you know watch as it develops and, and goes forward. But um, really looking forward to being rolled out. I mean, Tom, when is Copilot you know entering Teams? Yeah, it's a good question. It's still very early and a lot of these AI announcements are pre-announcements. So Microsoft haven't even got it rolled out completely internally. Only select people have it at the moment and we'll see it very phased. So the things you've seen in all these massive keynotes, I think will come out step by step. But Teams meeting transcripts and meeting summary feels like a contained use case where I think it will be one of the earlier ones. Um, I think we're looking at second half for some of this stuff in the real world. Yeah, fantastic. Well, I mean, another... Um... I suppose preview we got last week was uh, the new Teams client, wasn't it? Which was particularly interesting. Although I didn't see a huge amount of difference between Teams 1, is it 1.0 and 2.0? You know, Tom, what's your thing? Yeah, yeah, so we're calling original Teams, Teams Classic now, and new Teams is just Teams um, or new Teams. There is quite a big difference in day-to-day -day use. They did a demo at Enterprise Connect where they tried to launch them at the same time, and it was pretty close on the demo, to be honest. Um, but, I mean, the, the average uh, of some of the performance increases are uh, launch speed between 
the first app and the new app is two times faster but i mean how often do you launch um but join meetings is two times faster switching chats 1.7 faster 50 percent less memory 70 percent less disk space um but just generally snappier across the board where you really notice it is on low form factors so things like education laptops things like that where the resources were super constrained like if you've got a really powerful pc you're not going to notice too much but on those lower end form factor machines it makes a huge difference um, but also it has new features so it allow you to sign into multiple tenants simultaneously and receive notifications from all of them for so like a lot of the people on this session um, deal with multiple customers multiple environments it's much more like the mobile client now you'll just get notifications regardless of which tenant you're on you can even reply and switch tenants and still keep your meeting going so a much slicker experience with that cross tenant scenario which is really nice so all in the background, because I was kind of expecting to see some kind of new user interface, but it, it, it does look a little bit different. Is that correct? Yeah, that they've, they've, they've toned, toned down the purple a little bit, a bit more clean and modern. And there, there are new experiences. So things like channel chat now um, has a slightly different experience where the most common chat is at the top and you create a new thread and reply to a thread in different positions. So day to day, again, that cleans up the experience slightly for, um, for the channel based chat. Uh, but mostly the thing is the performance improvement and it's worth bearing in mind this is still preview so it's public preview anybody can get to it there'll be a toggle in public preview but it doesn't yet have third-party app integration it doesn't have advanced calling features like call queues and it doesn't have the advanced meeting capabilities like breakout rooms so hence it's preview it's not yet for everybody but i'd say 90 percent of users are, are going to see all the core features there it's just those line of business apps that is a real blocker for some people yeah for sure let's hear what josh has got to say well, Tom took what I was about to say, so thanks, Tom. That's uh, <laughs> but it, I, I was gonna I was gonna comment on the fact that the the chats are reordered, as Tom mentioned, uh, within the channel. So uh, I think that might help with some cleanup, but also it's gonna be it's gonna be a, a reverse reversal of training the brain to where we've been used to doing it X way for a while. We're gonna have to keep that in mind as as you switch over to the new client why things are a little different in there, but it is a sleeker, better feel. Um, and, and when you go, you know, back to the performance and the demo, like you said, those lower end laptops, I think is where you're going to feel it the most. I imagine they have the most clean type of environment they can for demos to make sure nothing goes wrong and angers the demo gods, right? Um, so they, they probably didn't have what we usually have, which is 30 different applications, 20 different uh, you know, 20 is being generous tabs open in our browser the things that really bog down the machine and, and will let you notice a difference in that client i'm sure they were operating under a much cleaner environment so yeah it was it was a bit negligible on stage um plus nicole cheated and clicked start a little too early so, <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, yeah i i agree with the performance i think it's much needed i think you know the client has been around for a few years now and it and it needed it needed an update from the performance perspective. And I think for enterprise customers, the worst thing you can have is it's like, it's like you know, one bad team's meeting goes around the world in about 30 seconds, I've noticed, and always seems to get to someone with C in the title. Um, and it, it was affecting people. So I'm really glad to see that performance. And I think it will make a big difference. Superb. Right. Well, uh, next up, we said we talk about um, bring your own device because that was another quite hot theme or hot topic at Enterprise Connect last week um, on the Microsoft stand. Tom, uh, tell us more. Yeah, this is huge. Like this got got slipped in at the very end of the keynote. Um, uh, it's like here's another option. But I mean, Microsoft traditionally has been quite down on BYOD, so it was like that. That's the suboptimal experience. But now I think the the the, the market pressures there of some customers wanting a BYOD option means Microsoft have responded. And what this is, they announced essentially. Uh, they call them low compute devices. So Android based devices, low compute, sub one thousand dollar price point, where you will have some kind of of a uh, unit that connects to the TV, uh, a little monitor and audio and video. And uh, in the first case that was announced was Crestron Air Media, a wireless dongle with a Teams button. So the compute is coming from your laptop, but it will hook up wirelessly to the screen and have a, a Teams-like experience. So you'll have a welcome screen that's showing it's a Teams room 
and you'll be able to connect no drivers, no software, and ping your meeting onto the big screen and have the proper audio video experience. That's pretty cool. Is there a particular use case that you think Microsoft are going after here, or is it just BYOD? We just think everyone's going to use this. Um, what do you think? Yeah, it's not. It's definitely not to replace the Teamstream experience. Like the Teamstream experience still has much more capabilities, things like front row, advanced audio, clever camera stuff. So this is a very basic experience. But I think it's just hitting that that a the price point that some people want to hit because not every room justifies a Microsoft Teamstream investment. Um, and b some people just like for whatever reason that BYOD experience. Maybe they're doing multi vendor on BYOD. Um, it'd be interesting to hear from the group. I know we've got a few people here what what their thoughts are, but it's quite a different different experience that Microsoft previously didn't have a blessed option for. If only we had someone here from Crestra. <laughs> we've, got you, some, we've got some everybody else. <laughs> um, so yeah, you know, when you look at that, uh, as you say, they sort of got that demo in at the last minute of, of this, you know, it's essentially what they call a Teams panel on that front room display. So it's that application, I think, is loaded on that questionnaire media. So you get to see, you know, a nice, uh, you know, Teams UI, should we say, on that front room display, hit the magic button, and then that will, you know, pop out essentially your Teams client just to have a front of room display so you don't see your, your chat and messages. So it's a nice, I think, clean solution for those orgs that want to do BYOD. As you say, Tom, you know, not everyone's stuck in Teams all day. We're, we're on multi-vendor applications. Um, but it'll be interesting to see, you know, this come to life and, you know, what other vendors will follow, I think, you know, obviously Crestron are first. Uh, it'll be interesting to see who else will, will develop this solution. Um, cause yeah, it, the, you know, the, the announcement it's not said a small multiple market. vendors are coming. Yeah, so there's definitely going to be other vendors in play. And I think Crestron's, uh, you know, tends to be a more premium brand as well in terms of price point and devices. So I think we'll see progressively more aggressive price points for that kind of stuff from other vendors as well. But, and just to follow on, anyone hear what Ilya mentioned in the keynote as well at the end a part, as part of BYOD? I'm sure, unless I'm dreaming this, I think he mentioned digital signage uh, as well. Um, so, you know, may not just be the the sort of Teams panel display. You know, the other vendors do digital, digital, digital signage as part of their ecosystem. So is this uh, Microsoft starting to dab, you know, dabble in the water with uh, enterprise signage? Yeah, I think that was mentioned. Also, um, all this stuff reports back into the pro portal as well. So mm, you can get yeah. management updates, reporting as well, which is really, really important. That's one of the things that BYU doesn't give you traditionally is proper understanding of is, is the kit up and running and plugged in and being used. Um, but yeah, you've got that. I mean, what's interesting is most things are a low compute Android device these days. So will we see all in one monitors, which already have Android, potentially have wireless streaming in them and become uh, a, a team's light endpoint of some type. Um, will Microsoft restrict this to kind of certain sizes or certain types of devices? It'll be really interesting to see where where the line is drawn on feature and functionality and price between the BYOD option and the the, the proper Microsoft Team Dream option. Yeah, of course, Microsoft are going to charge money for this. So there's a shared device license is required to actually get them to to appear in the pro portal for the management. So, you know, I guess BYOD is a really bad option if Microsoft aren't making any money out of it. But as soon as Microsoft get a little bit of the money, then yeah, BYOD, go for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's a good no, point. Yeah, there'll be, hat, a but, there'll be, um, be a license yeah. leveraged here, which is, uh, is an upside yeah. for Microsoft for sure. But just imagine, you know, certified camera, certified audio, that kind of thing plugged into this thing at the screen side, reporting back into the pro portal and potentially getting updates by the pro portal for, you know, whatever camera audio and whatever else you've got plugged in. I think that's a, that's a really good thing. Um, you know, it just, it just makes it a first class citizen. I mean, of course, a lot of the vendor options actually do BYOD, neat, Logi, everybody else has a BYOD flip of some description built into the base solution. Um, but that takes it out of the team's land and into its own, you know, kind of vendor ecosystem things. So yeah, I wonder if that will ever kind of come to the foreground as well. Yeah, this was the interesting thing about this BYOD. It's BYOD, your own computer for a Teams meeting, not BYOD, any client for any platform as well. So you're still mm. kind of locking into the Teams ecosystem as I understood it. I don't yeah. know if it, if Air Media has, I mean, obviously Air Media have a generic mode as well, but is judging by previous things in Teams, I imagine the Teams version will be a Teams version. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it remains to be seen whether you'll be able to join a... A meeting from another platform, as you said. Mm. 
Well, staying with team runs, uh, we also heard a little bit of news about Surface Hub last week, Tom, didn't we? Yeah, another interesting one that uh, got announced actually on stage is uh, Surface Hub 2S is going to be a proper legit Microsoft Teams Rooms on Windows device. So a uh, bit of background, uh, the Surface Hub runs a fork of Windows called Windows Team Edition, which is nothing to do with Teams, bless Microsoft's naming, it's just a, a Team Edition singular. And that runs the, the, the experience you get on a Surface Hub, so a collaborative experience that runs the, the third party apps as well. Uh, Microsoft are now moving towards those units running standard Microsoft Teams rooms on Windows, so running Windows, I think it's IoT, uh, and then running the Windows uh, Teams app. So quite a different experience. They'll be like any other Microsoft Teams rooms on Windows. You'll be able to attach any of the certified peripherals to the service hub. Um, but what's interesting here is that will make it a Microsoft Teams unit on Windows and Microsoft Teams unit on Windows don't currently support apps. So you're losing some functionality there as a Surface customer. There's like a two year window, so it's quite a long time away. Um, but I wonder if that will put the pressure on Microsoft in terms of Teams as a platform to start bringing apps to that large form factor experience. And if they do, is that a Microsoft Teams unit on Windows experience? Is that a Microsoft Teams unit on Android experience? We've talked before about the two worlds coming together. Um, I, I find it interesting that Teams is an app platform and we can put apps on panels, we can put apps on Teams display, but we can't put apps on rooms, you know, so it'd be interesting to see where that goes. Yeah, absolutely. Well, so uh, next up, we said we talk about Microsoft Android OS. Tell us more. Yeah, this is another huge one that it didn't even get mentioned on the on the stage, just got mentioned in the blocks. So um, one of the challenges of, of Microsoft Teams Dreams on Android is people's trust in Android as a, as a platform and not abstractly just Android as a platform, but how those vendors, the, the OEMs that use Android look after it. Um, so there's loads of conversations about Android security and each vendor has to go through these hoops to prove that they patch their Android correctly, they lock it down correctly because that's owned by the OEMs. Um, now Microsoft are releasing an Android OS from themselves, which is quite interesting when you think about the kind of history and Google and stuff like that. Obviously, Android and Microsoft have had Android devices in the past, things like the, the, you know, the Surface Duo and their mobile devices, but very niche. But this is a specific variant of the Android open source operating system made by Microsoft, maintained by Microsoft, that's open to the OEMs to use as the basis for their room systems. So uh, in theory, this will tick a lot of boxes for enterprise customers who trust Microsoft and their pedigree to look after security and compliance. Um, the OEM takes that from Microsoft and updates it with Microsoft. Actually, uh, Jabra were the first to announce they will have a unit based on this new, new Microsoft OS. So I don't know, Josh, if you've got anything you can share on that front. I mean, it, it's such early stages that there's not a lot of meat on the bones outside of what Microsoft announced in their blog, right? And it it just so happened um, that with Jabra announcing the video bar system back at ISE coming out later in the year, that it was timing all lined up to say this is an easy one to to sit here and and uh, and work with with this new OS because it's still coming out and being developed. So um, so that will be the case, like you said, the ecosystem is going to be open a lot wider. I'm sure as time goes on. Uh, beyond that, it's just Jabra will will have that device out there whenever it becomes available later in the year. Um, hopefully later in the year, right? We all know how that timing works. Yeah. Um, so it's, but it, you know, at this stage, what it looks to be is, you know, an upgrade. And that's the, like, well, a lot, of the, a lot of the questions at the booth at Enterprise Connect centered around the whole upgrade process. And how does that work? Is it just, an, you know, a firmware upgrade, et cetera? And that's basically what, what customers would be looking at if they're running on, their OEM's own flavor of Android, they could get upgraded through Microsoft's portals to the new Android OS provided by Microsoft, which I love the way they name it. You just mentioned they're naming a minute ago, it devices partner ecosystem, or devices ecosystem platform or something like that. So not at all Microsoft yeah, it, Android. It's but. The, yeah, the, the, the Microsoft Android uh, MDEP, I think, is the yeah, Microsoft Devices platform, whatever it is. But uh, yeah, we're not using Mandroid. That's definitely not the term we're all going to use. <laughs> no, no, yeah. Um, it, I mean, it's, it's super interesting, though, because, you know, OEMs, some of them have more pedigree than others in terms of looking after Android and managing Android, and some of them embed features and, and abilities in their 
OS. So um, Empowering Cloud, the first piece of research we got asked for from enterprise customers was an Android bar comparison and which version of Android is running and how they look after it was a big topic of conversation. Yeah. So we've just finished that research and now we've got to go back to it again and look at the Microsoft option. Um, but it'll be interesting. I mean, are, are people like, are vendors going to have the Microsoft flavor of their OS and the standard flavor? Are we going to see Zoom Rooms running the Microsoft Android because it's just Android platform? Uh, super interesting to see Microsoft throw that hat in but I think it's good for good for Android in the enterprise because it even further legitimizes it as a platform in those customers that are super worried about you know security updates and patching it just it removes a lot of roadblocks to to the conversation as a customer progresses down the Android path it's it's that whole separate conversation about well let me see white papers or what you did to they're trusting the platform already. They've already selected teams. Yeah. Now they, they can continue to select that choice or, or trust that choice into the OS running on the device and not have to worry about a whole third conversation with the OEM provider. So um, it, it'll be interesting to watch the story unfold for sure. Well, Good stuff. I, I think, you know, I was just going to say quickly, you know, how many customers ask for a white paper on Windows? Um, probably none. They always ask it for Android uh, yeah. to make sure it's compliant, and hopefully this will tick a box. And by my wish as well is that it'll you know whitelist the device as a trusted, certified device, so you don't have all these complex Intune policies that customers have to go through and hoops to jump through to get them approved. So it'll be interesting to see um, this platform develop. Yeah, I think also for the, the monitoring and reporting and stuff, Microsoft will be able to embed their agents at the OS level. So we should get, uh, in theory, over time, a better insight on the on the Microsoft Android OS as to exactly what's going on. Like you say, it should sail through Intune as a whitelisted device, that kind of thing. And who knows? Maybe it'll be less of a um, to, uh, feature comparison question out there. Well, what what's on Windows and what's on Android? Maybe Microsoft will actually tighten up the... Uh, the feature release schedule a little bit. That would be cool. I'm not holding my breath, but that would be pretty cool. Um, yeah, it would be interesting to see if Microsoft mandate the the you know the their Android version to the OEMs, because then you're in a position of some OEMs will take it, some won't. How does that affect the market? It's, it's um, you know it's it's going to be an interesting one as it as it develops. That's for sure. I'm just wondering whether that's uh, this is building a new cool kids club for, you know, for customers. You know, when was it last year? Microsoft released that um, Android support timeline post out of nowhere, and suddenly every customer in the world was asking, "Oh, you know, what's what's happening with your version of Android?" And you know, I'm not going to name any uh, OEMs or anything like that on their schedules and things like that. Most have all you know pulled their socks up and kind of gone to Android 10 based on that article but that was an insistence from customers that everybody be on at least android 10 and when's 11 coming and when's 13 coming yeah, yeah. you know all that kind of stuff our yeah. customers are going to be saying well if your yours isn't built on microsoft's version of android so yeah we're just going to go to the ones that are you know yeah i think you're right i think that it'll be it'll be how much weight customers put in it will dictate yeah. how big the oems do it you know if, if oems see deal sizes where they're like it'll only be in the game if you're with the microsoft android os i'm sure they'll mm. present options um i can't imagine every vendor going to it because particularly the ones that are more mature in the market they have clever things they do at the os level that crosses vendors so it's interesting simon as you say do they do they make that uh, certification standard at some point uh, we'll see but the Android that's running on these things is barely Android. It's just, you know, it's a scaffolding for yeah. which you hang an OS. You know, Neat have their, their Neat OS, Logi have Collab OS, Poly have Poly OS, Jabra have, I don't know what it is, Josh, you can correct me what, what the name is now that you have I don't Android know that devices, there's an official name out there yet. <laughs> Jabra OS. We'll call it Jabra OS. Jabra OS, yeah. Everybody has, you know, a version of an OS that sits on top of the scaffolding, which is, you know, device administrator Android. So... It'd be yeah. interesting to see if Microsoft is actually a little more than that scaffolding or if it's just another yeah. kind of variant of this scaffolding uh, that Google already do. I yeah. think it gives new vendors a boost as well. There's a lot of uh, there's yeah. OEMs. You know, If you look at the 12 OEMs we have in play at the moment, there's some that are relatively new to the device market yeah. and some that have been there for before Microsoft had devices. So like it's uh, it gives them an instant boost of credibility to say they're yeah. on the Microsoft OS, I think. Yeah, I, I think to Simon's point, it... I think it's going to be largely market driven, right? The, the, those that that don't get on 
and they aren't told to get on, if that's the case, um, I think they're just going to sit there and watch how the market responds. And if it's overwhelmingly customers saying we want the Microsoft trusted approach, then then, uh, you know, they'll they'll pivot according to the market. But it's a it's a wait and watch game. <laughs> and, and we know well, I mean, from the surface discussion, they don't sometimes Microsoft don't feed and water the, their their operating systems in the in the necessary time so i think that would be my the one that i would watch out for you know i think from an enterprise perspective they would always want they would appreciate the microsoft os but then when they turn around and say well we can't do feature a b or c because it's not running you know the certain version of os that the oem is running then it's a it turns into a different discussion and i i'd advise them not to get into that you know make it make it consistent if they can well, certainly lots to think about, isn't it? So, Tom, let's talk team displays. We've got a couple more things to get through before we jump onto the devices. Yeah, team displays, um, two really good announcements here. So first one is a QR code sign-in. I think we've all been asking for a simple way for team display sign-in for a while, and our competitor platforms definitely have those options. So in the hot desking scenario, you'll be able to rock up to a device, use the QR code on your camera, that will magically push you through to the Teams app. And you're know, kind of like if you've experienced like the Netflix type sign or BBC iPlayer sign in type experience, all syncs through and signs in. So that's really slick. Uh, and the other Teams display announcement was the uh, virtual receptionist, which is the idea of having a, a neat frame like device or any Teams display, but they demoed it with the neat frame sitting in a reception area one button to click through to a video receptionist who in theory could be covering out of hours or lots of different locations. Uh, and they had that demoed at the show as well. It's quite a, a slick experience. Okay, a couple of nice features there, certainly. And another one that was mentioned as well was click to call. I found this one particularly interesting. Do you want to take us through how that works? Yeah, this is interesting. This is not a new technology, but this is Microsoft kind of productizing and simplifying the idea of doing a, a voice and video call from a browser, and I guess potentially an app at some point into Microsoft Teams on the back end. So this is actually using Azure Communication Services, uh, which is the foundation of Teams to do a WebRTC call. What was interesting is there was no mention of WebRTC because that's not an industry term that everybody's excited about anymore. It was just like, look, you can have this browser plug into your website and do do magic team calls. Simon, I know with Cloud Interact, you do quite a lot of the kind of WebRTC, ACS type stuff. Is that something you were seeing as market demanded or is that Microsoft just tidying up the story? What were your thoughts there? No, it's, it's absolutely market demand. Uh, there, there is a clear shift going on in the contact center space from telephony into chat and voice and video. But when you actually look at the market, there isn't that many options for voice, you know, for that kind of integrated service with voice and video. And the interesting thing for Microsoft is they actually have the products, they have the building blocks as, as, in Azure communication service. They have, you know, hundreds of millions of users on Teams, so they have agents that could could be sat behind. They just haven't quite put those building blocks together into a into a into a single product that they can go and articulate the value to to any enterprise customer at the moment. So. Um, I'm glad. I'm glad they've done that. It's not new technology. It's around 12 months. You know, it's about 12 months old. Um, but I'll be interested to see if they can start to articulate. And it's something that we're doing. So we're we're a little bit agnostic in terms of um, you know Amazon or Salesforce or Microsoft. And um, it is interesting that we go and speak to quite a few Microsoft uh, shops, but they feel they don't have the option to to be able to use that capability but and then we and then we say well we can if you want we just have to uh you know we have to put it together there's no simple sign up plan yeah i think that's it it's been buried in dev land now microsoft are giving it a skew basically so i think we'll see a lot of um smb mid-market being like oh, I'm, I'm perfectly happy to do this plug into my website and suddenly have video calling yeah and then just finally the table stakes is always still telephony and i, I feel like we're going back to the debate of 12 13 years ago where you know, telephony will disappear in the enterprise. It, 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 you know, it's taken a big hit over the 13 years and it will disappear in the contact center, but not yet. You have to, the table stakes are you have to enter with a good PSDN dial in dial out capability so that you can at least get customers across and then transfer to the new capabilities. I don't think you're going to go into many customers uh, and say, just ditch your phone lines that you've been using for, you know, 15, 20, 25 years and go to this newfangled technology. Um, mm. 
Yeah, it's going to be an additional option, isn't it? Like like having that. Like I think every website now has web chat. Like you'd expect that. That's the base. Hopefully, in a few years, we'll expect click to call, click to video yeah. on websites as well. Yeah. Good stuff. Well, let's talk uh, Teams devices because uh, we saw something interesting on stage last week at Enterprise Connect, which was a collaboration between Cisco and Microsoft, Microsoft on stage, wasn't it, Tom? I mean. Yeah, this was the this was the big big thing for most people at the show. To be honest, was the fact that uh, Cisco turned up on the Microsoft keynote and Microsoft turned up in the Cisco keynote, um, both promoting the fact that Cisco devices now have a mode to run Microsoft Teams rooms, so like legitimate certified devices. And the first two certified devices from Cisco are now out, so officially certified the the Board Pro um, and the other board. And I think that it, it just shows the follow through on the announcements we saw previously where Cisco are prepared to, you know, join the Microsoft ecosystem and be a device partner option for customers that want that Cisco device but want the Microsoft ecosystem. I mean I'm key to hear what everyone else has got to say on this, but is, is that as easy as it sounds taking a Cisco device and connect it into the Microsoft world or uh, you know things are going to need upgrades and, and, and whatnot to kind of get there. Yeah, I don't know if anybody wants to jump in, but I mean, it's only a select number of devices that run a, a that run the chipset. So it is, it's not every Cisco device suddenly works for Teams. It's it's a small subset and mostly new devices. Correct. Yeah, I think it's you know anything released in the last you know six nine months. You know all the I think it's Nvidia based uh, chipsets in the Cisco devices. So it's the, the newer hardware. Um, so now this let's call it first uh, batch of devices are done. They're now working on the next next devices from Cisco. So I think it's their WebEx bar and their, uh, you know, their larger room system. Um, but yeah, it's certainly interesting that they've got, you know, if we look at the the board sizes, you know, we've got Cis we've got the Surface Hub at 50 inch and and 85. You've now got Cisco with 55 and 75. Um, you've got um, Neat with a 65 inch, and then you've got Yealink with 65 and uh, 86 or 85, I think. So, lots of variables, you know, for customers to have choice on what size screen I feel, they want. I, I, I feel an infographic coming on. <laughs> we've also <laughs> ne then we've got the Microsoft Teams on Windows option and the Microsoft uh, Teams on Android options as well. So we've got some interesting variants in the board board space. I think that's a stroke of of genius on Microsoft's part, um, specifically from his leadership that that came into play several years back. That, like you just mentioned, they you need to play with Microsoft nicely in whatever part of the ecosystem you're in. And I think that's a direct result that Microsoft finally understood they needed to play nicely with others in the ecosystem. And that worked out in their favor immensely in all kinds of ways. And this is just some of the fruits of that shift in mindset. We're going to work well on with Linux and Apple and whoever. We're going to play nice. Um, and, and it's come back to, to benefit them. But yeah, to the, to the point of the devices in the Cisco ecosystem, you know, having recently come from Diversified, that was an interesting conversation about when Cisco entered the market, what does this look like for our customers? You know, how does that impact all the other OEMs out there? And you definitely see this giant pause as customers are like, we're about to go into rooms. Wait a minute, what's the Cisco announcement? We all have a bunch of Cisco stuff. What does this mean for us? And it's taken time to unpack that to learn, hey, does this fleet of legacy devices, does this qualify for me for essentially a free upgrade or something? And a lot of them had to come to learn, no, that doesn't mean that. <laughs> there are select devices. That's a specific path forward. Free, free, um, free, in, free in Cisco, Josh. That should have been an easy one, right? <laughs> right, you know. But it, it took them time, it, it, collectively, a large segment of the market. It took them a moment to understand, digest that news, and really figure out, okay, so do we continue on Cisco hardware or do we actually pivot? And um, I think there's a select few of them are like, oh, great, we're in, a, we're in a perfect situation. We can keep utilizing this equipment. The wide majority of them were like, oh, can we? No, nope, we can't. All right, so what? Do, how do we move forward? Then I think we're yeah, going to I think, I think that Yeah, I think to your point, a lot, a lot of customers suddenly thought they could take their legacy Cisco equipment and it would magically teamsify it and they were like really excited. Yeah. And now it's like, well, I've got to spend money on new kit. Do I still look at the ecosystem options? And there are a set of hardcore Cisco customers where they, they want to stay on Cisco yeah. hardware and they probably will. But I think most people will look at the market options. Uh, and, and we've seen this before. I mean, good luck to this partnership, but like we've seen partnerships go hot and cold between Microsoft and Cisco. So we'll keep a close eye on this over the next you know, months and years and see if they every Cisco device stays in fashion with Microsoft. 
Yeah, it it must have been an incredibly difficult decision for Cisco, because if you're in that Webex team, then it, you know it's like, oh, can we put Webex on the on the uh, on the Microsoft Teams rooms? Uh, well, you only can by direct join, not not you know not in the partnership way. So, you know, I think it tells you all all it needs to know about where Webex and and Microsoft Teams are relative in the marketplace at the moment. You know, is it the uh... Is it the modern day cookie link? You know, how long will it last before the next upgrade comes and then it breaks everything? <laughs> yeah, I mean, the nice thing here is they're running, literally they're running the Microsoft Teams room. So in yeah. theory, it should be a lot more robust. It's not a, not a fork or a plugin, but yeah, yeah, I think everybody's, people that have been in the industry for a decade are, are watching, <laughs> seeing what happens. Yeah, I don't, I don't think it is the same as cookie link because cookie link and cookie mark was an attempt of Cisco to insert their software into the into their desk into the desktop effectively competing and the, and it was basically a, a gambit to say well you know it kind of works together uh, but you still had to buy cisco software whereas on here you, you have to buy obviously cisco hardware but but not the software and i think that's that's the big difference perfect so uh, one more device update tom uh, poly studio x70 that's uh, a new announcement yeah, this is notable. This took a while to come through and get announced. It's notable because it's the uh, certified for large meeting rooms. So it's a bar form factor on Android, um, but certified for large meeting rooms and has Poly's direct AI in it. So interesting to see a bar that can cap can be capable of a large meeting room. Fantastic. And uh, from the wider ecosystem, we just thought, thought we'd better mention uh, Landis, uh, uh, Landis's certification. Yeah, yeah. Congrats to Landis. They've certified for the uh, contact center extend model. Uh, so I think we're up to eight certified vendors for extend. It's still really interesting in the market. I'm not seeing enterprises necessarily understand the difference between the different certifications in Microsoft contact, uh, contact center for teams. Uh, so Landis have got the one where they're more tightly integrated. And we've still not seen any information on the, the power, which is the next certification up. Nobody's hit that yet, but I'm, I hear on the grapevine there'll be stuff coming around that. But yeah, congrats to Landis being in the mix and officially certified. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, well, um, before we round up uh, today's session, let's just talk about a few events that are coming up. Tom, uh, what's top of your list? Uh, yeah, so we've got a few exciting events coming up. So um, uh, we've got Ilya on the uh, Teams Fireside chat, our, our monthly chat online. Uh, we've just had all that Microsoft Teams news, the BYOD news, so really excited to get into the mix on that. Uh, and we'll get into the real detail around that. That'll be quite fun. That's this month. We've got Comsv Next coming up this month as well. So that is the show in Denver, Colorado towards the end of this month, 25th, 26th of April. Uh, that'll be a really good show. Always lots of really good speakers there. A few people I see here are on are speaking there as well. And Crestron Modern Work Summit is uh, May 23rd, 24th. I'll be doing a panel there, and I think we're going to try and organise some kind of empowering cloud uh, breakfast meetup or something as well. So if you're going to that event, let me know, and I'll uh, I'll get you on that list. Fantastic, thanks for that, Tom. And just before we leave, um, I just wanted to go to the room and get uh, a little bit of kind of feedback or perspectives on uh, the latest kind of Copilot uh, release uh, or feature set. Um, what do we think of Copilot? Is it going to help increase Microsoft's uh, monthly active users, for example? Do we see it, it, it as a game changer for Microsoft Teams? Well, I think I think they've done the they've got hit the first base of I, I know CIOs who are asking, oh, what's all this Copilot? People who are not particularly necessarily in favour of Microsoft at the, at the sort of C level, it's it's definitely hit a mark. So you know, well done to well done to them for that. I'm not so sure about Copilot in itself, but in terms of the the AI discussion, I, I saw a couple of stats that kind of brought it home. Uh, U.S. workforce 164 million, 50, what 20 percent of the workforce could hit be hit by 50 percent of of automation with AI, 80 percent of the workforce hit by 10 percent. When you run those numbers, that's millions and millions of of, of days work that are going to disappear. And obviously, Microsoft are right at the front of that with OpenAI, and uh, and obviously they'll they'll go they'll use Copilot to compete with with the you know the Zooms of the world or whatever. So um, it's going to be a very exciting time over the next six months. I just hope it doesn't disappoint. I hope I hope there's something real behind it. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm curiously optimistic about it. Just because of playing with ChatGPT, you can see the power. Like, like I use it now for ChatGPT, that is, for things like um, podcast summaries and synopsis for things we're doing in Power and Cloud. And it needs a bit of tuning, but it's already there. I use a third-party uh, II product for some slide creation as well. So the technology is there. I think the interesting thing with Microsoft is the the whole compliance conversation, GDPR, Italy just banned chat GPT. Like how are Microsoft going to handle that conversation in enterprise around where's the data go? How do I get it deleted? How do I discover it? With large models like that, it's it's very complicated. And, and they're very fortunate, right? Because in the data models, they've already got all the data within within M365. So they can, and they've got open AI as an Azure service. So you can see them very quickly turning around and saying, well, we know everyone's using chat GPT externally. So implement it internally. Within yeah, maybe the they can make this the secure variant of, of chat GPT. That's interesting. That's a really interesting angle. You go uh, into exactly. marketing, Simon. <laughs> well, it, it's not it's not my idea, actually. Someone very smart 12 to 13 years ago said um, uh, it, BPOS D is an, or BPOS S at the time it wasn't really about the service charges, it was about getting all the data and then selling it back to organizations, selling their own data back to organizations. And that person is uh, is uh, pretty pretty close to the mark, I think. <laughs> but I think with, um, you know, who is the target user? Is it going to be the elite, you know, five, ten percent of power users? Or is it going to be everyone, you know, from you know the frontline worker right up to contact center and, and everyone else? Um, and again, as Patrick says, at what price? Uh, who will be afforded access to it, I think is key. Well, I think, I think it'll be everyone. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think, um, like you can't go for free. I if, I think, uh, <laughs> it'll probably, it'll probably work its way into premium at some, in some kind of way. Um, so whether or not it moves the needle on daily active users at large, I, I would be doubtful about that at large, whether it moves the needle on premium subscriptions, because Microsoft is figuring out how in the world to continue to drive adoption of premium, how to make that a success. Um, maybe, maybe that's where it has an impact and it starts to carve out some space through through uh, through premium. But I would be surprised if it like suddenly increased their overall cloud audience. Mm. I think it, it could also be a, a good, a useful tool for Microsoft to say, to the enterprise, why are you splintering your data off into another platform? And I'll just take, you know, Zoom or or Slack. You know, but if you if you put your data in multiple platforms, then we're not going to be able to run the the AI magic uh, via the graph and via open AI. So therefore, let's justify having all your chat and all your meetings within within one platform, and uh, and we'll be able to run it. That that might be another angle that they might they might use. Yeah, I'd say getting people over from from other yeah meeting platforms into Teams meetings is is one big thing. I know customers that are using you know Teams for collaboration and chat and things internally, maybe even phone calls to some extent, but they might be using another meeting platform, um, which you know, kind of makes doesn't make any sense to me actually paying for two different platforms. But you know, I think you know if, and, unless that other platform had some capability to do this AI stuff. But the problem is it's losing a lot of context. If it's just a meeting in isolation, it doesn't have access to any of the data that's behind anything or actually the org list or, you know, all that sort of thing. Um, I heard examples of, you know, sort of um, somebody mentioning somebody by nickname and actually because of the context of the people that were actually in that call, actually figuring out who that's, that person's identity was in AD and, and things, you know, it's like, that's mind boggling. If you're on another, another, another platform doesn't have access to all of that, then it ain't, it isn't going to be possible. So actually getting people over to, to use teams meetings, I think is a big thing. And then again, you know, if they're using, you know, webinars or any of the premium features, again, it's going to sell premium licenses. And the fact that, you know, you also, this also touches office, you know, it isn't just gonna be a team's premium thing, is it? You know, if you want it to make a PowerPoint presentation for you, it's going to be sort of part of the office of sub yeah, subscription. I, I think we'll see a copy in our little you, side chat E10, you know, the, the whole suite. And uh, I think, I think it's gonna be a pretty justifiable skew, to be honest, because like, if you yeah. look at the productivity saving it's very overt, like if it can create 70% of a PowerPoint for me for 10 yeah. bucks or 15 bucks a month, I'm all over it. Like, yeah, I've like got just a PowerPoint that one to create for an, for an event coming up. So <laughs> 
Exciting times times ahead. Well, Tom, I suppose it remains to be seen whether this is the the hype, uh, you know, surrounding this new technology, or whether we will, uh, whether it will take um, uh, hold in the marketplace. But we'll see, and we'll keep updating everyone on this as it uh, unravels. Uh, Tom, uh, thank you so much for joining me today. Yeah, no, thanks. Thanks for everybody who joined us as well for all the opinions. And it was, yeah, it was a great show, Enterprise Connect. And thanks to everybody who I spoke to during that week as well. So uh, we'll, as you say, we'll see how this news unravels and we'll be back next month with uh, more news and more details. Yeah, thanks everyone for joining us. And that's it from us. If you've enjoyed today's session, please subscribe to UC Today News and give this video a quick share on social. It's always appreciated. And if you're a Microsoft Teams fan and want to be part of the conversation, you can connect with Tom, myself, and our guest speakers on LinkedIn and Twitter, and our social links are in the description. So thanks to everyone for joining me. We'll be back again next month. I'm Rob Scott from UC Today. Thanks for watching.